is it specific parts of the brain have mitochondrial dysfunction that then contribute to specific uh, psyche, uh, psychological symptoms? Or is it different than that? Is it more generalized? So that is, um, I mean, in my mind, that's actually one of the important aspects of the theory is that everybody's going to be different. We kind of already know that. Any mental health clinician already knows that. Different patients have different symptoms, different levels of intensity of symptoms. But we just talked about the syndromes that psychiatry has instituted as part of DSM. Yes. Right? Where it's these symptoms is this diagnosis. Now, but what you can't say is like, all right, this syndrome with these, uh, with, with these symptoms, with this diagnosis, locates mitochondrial dysfunction to this part of the brain. We, so we can do a little bit of that. So for some of the symptoms of psychiatric diagnoses, like we just talked about suicidality, mm -hmm. that researchers are identifying the interconnected brain networks that produce that state. Um, for some of them, we're, we, we actually know the circuits pretty well. Mm -hmm. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a very clear one. Mm -hmm. We know the circuits pretty well. Prefrontal cortex and amygdala yes. are the two key areas for um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And interestingly, you can have hyper excitability in the amygdala or you can have underactivity in the prefrontal cortex to produce the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So in that circumstance, right there, I'll, I'll focus in on that. Two brain regions clearly implicated almost unequivocally in post-traumatic stress disorder. The metabolic theory of mental illness helps us understand both. So one person might have abnormal cells with mitochondrial dysfunction within the amygdala that are producing hyperexcitability of the amygdala. That person would have PTSD symptoms. Another person could have mitochondrial dysfunction in the cells of the prefrontal cortex, resulting in underactivity of those neurons that could also then produce the same symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So both patients could have the same symptoms, but they may have pathology or mitochondrial dysfunction in different regions of the brain. So the, the easiest way to think about it, let me give you a simpler analogy. Because on, on one hand, people are like, wait, you're getting too complicated and it's not going to be useful anymore. So we have, these, we have a metabolic disorder called heart attacks. Everybody kind of sort of knows what heart attacks are. They're due to metabolic dysfunction. What causes that metabolic dysfunction? A lot of things. Biopsychosocial. Bad diet. Lack of exercise. Poor sleep. Stress. Trauma. Childhood adversity dramatically increases your risk for having a heart attack. Having a mental illness increases your risk for having a heart attack. So there are lots of things that increase risk, that play a role in metabolic dysfunction that results in what we call a heart attack. So if you ask me, well, where exactly is the pathology in a heart attack? I'm going to say it could be anywhere in the heart. It could be one artery in one person. It could be a different artery in a second person. It could be three major arteries in a third person. But you're saying um, heart attack, regardless of where it is, gives you a specific set of symptoms. So what I'm so so in that case, metabolic dysfunction can result in different pathology in different parts of the heart. It can be different. It can be in different locations of the heart. But at the end of the day, it's still useful to know that this person has heart disease 
due to a metabolic problem because the treatment algorithms are common sense. We're going to clean up your diet. We're going to get you exercising. We're going to decrease your stress. We're going to make sure you're sleeping well. Doesn't matter which artery in the heart was affected, those treatment strategies are going to be universally affected. So fundamental question still is, well, why did one, why did the first patient only have this artery and the other one had three arteries? Why? We don't know, but we don't need to know right now because we know treatment strategies that can be effective regardless of where in the heart the dysfunction is showing itself. When it comes to the brain, it's a whole other story. The exact same principle that I just described still applies. The dysfunction can occur anywhere in the brain. So there's a randomness to the dysfunction. But when it comes to the brain, it really does matter where in the brain the dysfunction is because you're going to get wildly different symptoms. One person might start getting OCD symptoms. Another person might be getting PTSD symptoms. Another person might be getting depression symptoms. And another person might be getting psychotic symptoms. So that begins to help us understand, well, that's why this person has certain symptoms or certain diagnoses or certain three diagnoses. And another person is going to have different diagnoses or different symptoms. So that helps us understand that. But it also helps us understand why all of the disorders are interconnected. Why, if you have one of the disorders, you're more likely to develop any of the other ones. It helps us, and most importantly, like treating heart disease or preventing heart disease, it gives us a broad class of therapeutic strategies that we can use to help people get better. But you don't think the reason for that variability in symptoms from the brain dysfunction secondary to mitochondrial dysfunction, you don't think that's important to understand and to know, like moving forward? So some of it, oh, there's no doubt. The scientist in me wants to know the granular details. The scientist in me wants to know why does person A with a heart attack only have one artery and person three has three arteries. Sure. I want to know that. But at the end of the day right now, I don't need to know that the answer to that. It's an interesting scientific question. It will undoubtedly lead to better therapeutic strategies or medications or approaches in the future. Zero doubt. So I am all for, yes, let's plow ahead with that research. Let's understand the granular detail. We already can understand some of that granular detail. So some of that granular detail is that some neurons respond to serotonin you know, on their cell membrane. Other neurons respond to dopamine. Other neurons respond are highly sensitive to estrogen, for instance. Some neurons are highly sensitive to testosterone. Mm. Um, so if somebody has a testosterone deficiency, the neurons that are most impacted by testosterone are most likely to be negatively impacted and begin to malfunction or become dysfunctional in some way. And so, so I think we can start to map out some of the granularity of, oh, this person had these risk factors. That's why he or she probably has these disorders or symptoms. But again, it's like treating obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. You can have somebody who comes to you who's obese, diabetic, and is having chest pain. You don't need to know the granular details of the biology in order to come up with a treatment program for that person and help them improve their health. And what I'm arguing is that those same treatment strategies, which are not all going to be diet and exercise. Everybody thinks it's just diet and exercise. It's not. It's also sleep and managing your substance use. If you're smoking, if you're drinking, if you're using a lot of marijuana, that needs to go. But it's also psychological and social. You, we need to reduce their stress. They need to not be a type A personality. They need to maybe try meditation or mindfulness. Those are all strategies to help prevent a heart attack. Well, guess what? Mindfulness, reduce your substance use, get good sleep. 
Those are strategies for your brain too, for mental illness, even the serious mental illnesses. And what I'm saying is that we can use comprehensive strategies like that in the way that we do for the metabolic disorders. We can use those same strategies to help heal people's brains.